is chairperson of Oregonians seeking alternatives to the death penalty, will be co-presenting a workshop on perspectives on alternatives to the death penalty. Right now, some interesting things are happening from California through Washington about getting the death penalty repealed. Too often in our society, capital punishment and those things that go on behind the walls of our penitentiary are too far removed from our daily consciousnesses, out of sight, out of mind. And what Ron and I want to do today is sort of make you more aware of some things that are going on on the Pacific Northwest and how you might be uh, instrumental in these initiatives in seeing to it that the death penalty is repealed. In Oregon, I was responsible for administering through two of the executions that have taken place over the past 50 years. And I'll let you know how I've come full circle in terms of being against the death penalty. I haven't always been against it. And you'll understand how I might have been for it for many years. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting us to this. Uh, we didn't think we'd come to Fellowship of Reconciliation and find a whole lot of people that were in favor of the death penalty. Uh, if there are some that will come to our uh, uh, workshop this afternoon at FER 115, uh, we will listen, as Dr. Wolf instructed, we will listen very well. But we're really talking to people about uh, the action plan to get this accomplished. You're, you're, you're dealing with a whole lot of very important issues here some worldwide issues, uh, some local issues. Uh, many of them are gonna take a long, long time to accomplish and your work will, will help to do that. We have an issue that can be accomplished within the next couple of years and hopefully we can give you some tools to help mobilize and motivate other people to be with us on this subject. So we hope you'll be with us. Thank you. All right, welcome, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to get started with just, just quick introductions of where you're from, Oregon or, or Washington or one of the other wonderful states around the country. This is the session on alternatives to the death penalty. And uh, I want to have Frank Thompson reintroduce himself uh, quickly and then we have a special guest from here in Washington and then we'll go around the room get everybody's name so we know who's here. Frank Thompson, retired superintendent of corrections, uh, ran five different penitentiaries in the state of Oregon, wow. 27 years of law enforcement and corrections experience. Um, the core of my being a part of this program is I've come to be uh, against the death penalty after having administered two executions in the state of Oregon. And I'll be talking to you about how I came to this point. Okay. And I want to introduce Bryn Smith with the Washington Coalition Against the Death Penalty. Oh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Bryn Smith and I'm the field organizer, the grassroots organizer with the Washington Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, and I'll be talking about the statewide campaign in Washington and some of the or other organizations that are involved and, and a bit about our strategy moving forward. Uh, the way we're going to do this today is we're, we're going to share some information with you, some factual information first, and then maybe do some, some storytelling about all of this. Uh, Glenn says he's been working on this for decades, and uh, I was involved previously in New Mexico for nine years on their steering committee before I moved to Oregon. And a gentleman, uh, at one point in time, after a lot of frustration, we'd put in a bill, and it was defeated, and put in a bill, and it was defeated, and put in a bill, and I said, this has taken an awful long time. And he said, son, working on the death penalty is a little like redwood farming. <laughs> so... So we have to be persistent and, uh, and, and patient, and, and I've learned to be that way, but we're getting very close, and that's why we're so happy to be here with uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation, because I don't think we have to convince a lot of people. There's no, is there anybody here who's in favor of the death penalty? We will listen intently if you are, but this session is more uh, to provide information uh, to hopefully help you understand how to motivate, how to talk to people that maybe feel otherwise. We're going to share some information uh, that is very well documented, some empirical studies uh, that, that point out that a lot of people who say they're for the death penalty, their view is weakly held. And, and that's a, a pretty important thing uh, when we talk to people that are somewhat conflicted about all of this. So we'll have a little 
presentation time, if we will, but I want to give you folks all a chance to voice your own opinions about this and maybe a little bit of experience. Then Frank is going to talk and we'll come back to other things and Bryn's going to talk about the, the uh, situation in, uh, in, uh, the situation in, <coughs> in Washington. So a lot of people don't get it that this is a peace issue. Is there anybody here who belongs to the Rotary Club? Any Rotarians here? The Rotarians across the state of Oregon, and maybe nationally, but particularly in the state of Oregon, has ta have taken up peace as, as one of their big issues. And Rotarians generally do lots of good things in their communities. But a guy by the name of Al Jubitz, you've probably seen Jubitz truck centers on the Interstate 5. Al Jubitz is a, a man with, with great means today, and he's devoting himself to peace. And he's got the Rotarians all figured into this thing. And there's lots of different trends that lead us to peace, hopefully lead us to peace, and the death penalty is one of the issues that he's talking about. We cannot have peace without justice. And the death penalty is, is emblematic of injustice that happens in our country to a great degree, and we have an opportunity to change that. So the death penalty is a peace issue, and those of you who are into uh, all of this, that's the reason you're here, to work on these, and, and we have an issue that can be solved in both Oregon and Washington within the next couple of years, maybe as early as 2014, hopefully no later than 2016, you can be a part of something that is great success. When we finally passed the death penalty in New Mexico, I cannot describe with words properly the elation that we felt from that victory. And we had put it in a bill in 2001 and lost, 2003 and lost, 2005 and lost. Governor Richardson, who had a great ambition to be the governor or the president at one point, he was on the other side. And so we have, we have years and years of letters to him. And then when it became politically okay for doing he finally flipped over. And then at what, the big celebration. There was a groundswell of support? Absolutely. When he finally, when they went to... Uh, to the Vatican or to Rome to celebrate, and they lit the the, uh, the uh, Colosseum in celebration. He gets up there and says, "I'm so proud of New Mexico. We did the right thing." With a big emphasis on "we," and he had nothing to do with it. So, unfortunately, it's a politicized issue. And just to make sure that you're all up to date on on certain things, there's a big difference. Both Oregon and Washington have a death penalty at this point. We are two of the 33 states that have a death penalty. Population in, in uh, Washington is uh, almost twice as much as it is in Oregon. But they deal with the death penalty a little differently. The prosecutors and the defense attorneys seem to have worked out the ability to litigate a lot of the cases. So there are not very many cases pursued for a death penalty in Washington. Consequently, they have only eight people on a row. They have five pending cases at this point. Another difference between the two states is the fact that uh, the death penalty can be changed in the legislature in Washington. There are only three states, Oregon, Florida, and California, that it's in the Constitution and will require a vote of the people. As many of you already know, California will vote this November. They had a petition uh, campaign. They, they needed 500,000 signatures to, to qualify. They got 800,000. Mm -hmm. They have lots of very notable people who have come out, people who wrote the uh, initial legislature to put the death penalty in, who have <coughs> changed their mind. District attorneys, in, in, including Gil Crosetti, who was the prosecuting attorney in the OJ trial, became a very nationally known. He's out for it. Uh, Jerry Brown is in favor of getting rid of it. So a lot is going to depend on the vote down there, and Oregon is going to have to do it in that fashion. In Washington, they're going to be able to do it in the legislature, and hopefully very soon. Conversely, to the minimal use of the death penalty and prosecution of death penalty cases in Oregon, we seem to have a propensity to go for it. Right now we have 37 people on our death row, 36 men and one woman. Uh, we, are, we have 30 cases pending. So there, there's a lot of things that we need to know about the death penalty and how we, how we best deal with that when we're talking to people.
There's a couple of other ins, uh, differences in Washington. They do have a, a major problem in, in racial disproportionality. Of the eight people on the row, uh, four of them, or 50% of them, are African Americans. The population, the black population in Oregon is 3.8%. Uh, generally, the juries that have convicted those people have been all white juries. And we're supposed to have a jury of our peers in our justice system. It doesn't work that way. Uh, there's cases that show specific bias in the courtroom. And there's also some cases that show prosecutorial misconduct. The most uh, uh, glaring one is Daryl Stenson case. Uh, this is a man who, uh, who, who uh, was convicted of murder of his wife and his business partner. And uh, apparently the detectives who were working on this, and Bryn might be able to add some to this, were fudging the evidence. And this has happened in more than a few cases around the country. And this man was convicted, and recently his case was overturned so that he's going to get a new trial. Uh, about 61% of all the cases in New Mexico, since they brought it back, have been overturned for people, mostly mistakes in terms of the judges uh, uh, charged to the jury and prosecutorial misconduct and things of that nature. And then in, in, in many cases, there's a geographic disproportionality. Very few counties represent, both in Washington and in Oregon, where the death penalties are pursued. It depends on the district attorney in each of those counties. So there's three counties, uh, Snomesh, King, and Pierce up here in Washington. Uh, the three counties around Portland, Marion County, and Lane County, where, New Jer uh, where University of New Mexico is, those are where most of them are. Of the 36 counties in, in Oregon, 19 have never pursued a death penalty. So what happens is uh, the state pays for a lot of the cost in those. The counties can't afford it. If the counties had to pay for it, they would be pursuing fewer cases in many cases. But I'm a little confused with this myth, that this is like myth number one, that it costs more to, uh, to uh, murder a person you know, in the death penalty the death, uh, death penalty than it does to keep them in prison for the rest of their life. Okay, uh, I'll try and give you a brief answer to that. It does, it's not just the execution itself, but the execution itself is expensive and Frank could talk to that, but it's all of the trials, the retrials, the, the death is different. They have to have two, two different trials, a guilt and innocence trial and a, uh, and a, a sentencing trial. So you have a lot more lawyers involved. There's automatic uh, appeals that go into it in Oregon. I don't know how many there are in Washington. There's 10 separate appeals. So all of those appeals really what drives up the cost. There's been 15 different definitive studies around the country in different states. And it's anywhere from four times as much to 10 times as much money to can maintain a death penalty system as it does uh, uh, to, to not have it, okay? In, in, in Oregon, we have the good fortune that the governor on November 22nd of last year declared a moratorium saying that under my watch, there will be no more executions. He believes strongly in, in that position. And he asked for a, a full discussion, a long, what he called a long overdue discussion about the death penalty. And that's what we Oregonians for all uh, alternatives to the death penalty, and we want you folks to be involved in, is leading that discussion. Because it's been our experience that people who hold positions on the death penalty are not necessarily knowledgeable about the subject, about all of the ramifications of having it. In fact, I can't tell you how many times people have said, do we have a death penalty in Oregon? I didn't know that. That's how knowledgeable they are. So we've been trying to do a lot of studies and trying to come up with um, ideas on how to get people engaged in that conversation. Uh, like uh, uh, Professor Wolf said this morning, engaging people on the, in that conversation is not to go after them this way and argue about it, but to listen and respect how they feel because good people can feel differently about the death penalty depending on the circumstances. But what our experience is, when people know the facts, when they understand all of the ramifications, it is very difficult to defend a death penalty. 
Um, these are some of the reasons that people say to support the death penalty. And when, and when you get into discussions, you'll hear these reasons. And again, good people can have reasons to support the death penalty. But if, if they don't know the facts, like the cost thing, the myth that it costs more to, to house them for life than it does to put them in for, for a death sentence, uh, those things can be dispelled. And the, uh, lots of things on this thing, there are counter uh, arguments on the other side. And, and these are some of the arguments that people use to oppose the death penalty. Same subject, but maybe more informed. Maybe more informed on that. Uh, in terms of the, um, the cost, we have all of those studies in, from the various states. Washington doesn't have a definitive study, do they? In Oregon, our, our figures that we can assemble without having a big discussion, uh, the cost in Oregon to maintain death penalty is over $20 million a year. A lot of that is in the defense, which the state pays for, and we have a, an exact figure from the budget. It's $12.8 million a year uh, just for the defense part. The prosecution usually has more money than that. And so our, our position on cost when we talk about that is if, if we could save some money on not having a death penalty and put those dollars into, into programs that really, in fact, do deter crime, we, we would have a much better and more peaceful society. So this is what people say when Gallup, Gallup has been measuring this for a long time, and they ask the simple question, do you favor or oppose the death penalty? And over the years, you can see how this number has gone up and down a couple of times. If you look way back in, in 1954, there were a lot of people in favor of the death penalty. In 1966, it had gone back to almost in balance. Think about what, what else was going on in 1966 in the 60s. Civil rights campaign was going on. Anti-war uh, campaigns were going on. We had more. At that time... Uh, in 1964, Oregon repealed the death penalty. And then sentiment started to go back in the 80s uh, when Reagan was uh, president and there was a whole lot of furor about tough on crime. All of the politicians were writing tough on crime. If you have a couple of terrible murders, people start to swing back. So it swung back in 84 to 75% in favor of it. It went up to 80% in, in 83. It started to go down and down and down, and it's getting closer. Now, the key point here is when people are asked the question, do you favor or oppose, period, you're going to get numbers like this. When they ask the second question, what if we replace the death penalty with life without the possibility of parole, which is going to be on the ballot in California, when we do ours, it's going to be on the ballot in New Mexico and all the other states it was on the ballot. The numbers flip-flop. So more people become in favor of opposing the death penalty. Question? Yes. Why does it have to be without the uh, possibility of parole? That bothers me. Well, because if you just ask people that simple question, do you favor or oppose it? you're probably going to lose that election. Giving people an alternative that keeps them just as safe, the man will be incarcerated, he's not going to, uh, going, going to get out, things of that nature. It's just a pragmatic thing that has to deal with it. Unless the country's feelings totally shift, it's very difficult to do without. Now, when you, let me just finish this point. If you ask other questions, if you say life without parole, and some of those savings go to cold cases, the numbers go down even more in our favor. If you say they have to work and provide restitution to the victim's families, it goes down even more. So just asking the yes and no question, it's called the gladiator question, up or down, mm -hmm. will probably lose. But if you start to get people to think about it a little more, they start to move over to the other side. Most people don't know that, for example, in Washington, the default for aggravated first-degree murder without the mitigating circumstances actually is life without life in prison without any chance of parole unless the jury actually imposes the death penalty. So if we were to legislatively repeal the death penalty, 
the law would just revert back to what the default is anyway. Okay. So this is a, this is a study which, which we discovered not too long ago, within the last six or seven months. It was done by three learned professors, uh, one from Oxford, another from the University of Cincinnati, which has the number one criminal law uh, course in, in the country, and another one from Radford. And they studied for uh, two decades all of the literature, all of the studies, all of the research, all of the polling that was done on the death penalty and came up with some conclusions. And their conclusions were that people will say they favor the death penalty or oppose the death penalty, but they have questions. They're somewhat conflicted. So here's what happens. You have some people over on the uh, left side of, of your view there that strongly support the death penalty. And it might be 20, 22, 25%. And people on the other side who oppose the death penalty strongly, they're not going to be swayed, no matter what you tell them, they're not going to be swayed, of maybe a similar another. But in between, there's people who say, yeah, I do, but I have questions about it. I do, but I have reservations about it. I, I oppose it, but there are some cases that maybe we should have it. Well, what happens is those blue numbers in the middle mount up to something like 60%, generally 60%. So again, that's why we have to have the conversation. That's why we have to get people to think about the death penalty. It's not a subject that a lot of people like to think about. They have to think about it, study it, read about it, listen to tapes, come to seminars like this, get into discussion groups, because this is our opportunity to move people to the other side, to the opposition side. And we have that great opportunity right now, particularly in, in Oregon and so many other states, with in the last five years having New York, New Jersey, New Mexico, Illinois, and now Connecticut. The tide is turning. Prior to New York, there's been a long time since the state got rid of the death penalty. One of those states abolished the death penalty? They abolished the death penalty. Oh. There are now 17 states that don't have it. The one that hasn't had it the longest time, the first piece of legislation when Michigan became a state in 1846 said, we'll have no death penalty, and they never have. Wow. And they have one of the most violent cities in the nation in Detroit, but they've never gone to a death penalty. So people can get along just fine without a death penalty. Have other states, in addition to Illinois, who have abolished the death penalty, have any of the other ones have um, like that wonderful professor at Northwestern who had students go and investigate and then got them off because of the yeah. mistrials and what misevidence? That was probably the most famous of those cases, but I can tell you in every state where there's good work being done to get rid of the death penalty, there's people like that. Innocence Project people, yeah. professors, young activists, people who are getting engaged. And that's, that's, again, why we're here, to get people mobilized, to know that you can make a difference in all of this. And the difference we want to make is with those people who have weakly held positions against the death penalty. And if we can talk to them and get them to open their minds, I think there's a good chance that we can convert those folks to other way of thinking. Now, the study goes on to say that there is symbolic reasons that people who uh, support the death penalty do it for some personal reasons that are of interest to them. They have weekly held issues, and some of it has to do with their core values, getting involved in understanding their core values. When Gallup asked the why questions, and this, this becomes pretty important, I think, 39.7% of the first responses given were those who supported capital punishment were for reasons like an eye for an eye or they deserve it. If you add another 12.7% of those, there's a big chunk of them. And the core value that those people are coming from is one of retribution. They feel strongly that somebody has to pay. Somebody has to pay. So that's a core value that they get in touch with. On the other end of the spectrum, those people who oppose the death penalty, 47% of them in this study indicate that they oppose the, the death penalty because they have a core value of sanctity of life. 
They take the position, it's against my religion, it's against my spirituality, it's not my place, God is the only one that can do those kinds of things. It's a sanctity of life issue for them. So we have people at either end of the spectrum. What the other one is, is coming up is, is they have findings that people who were most likely to have express reservations were concerned with the fairness aspect of it. And we could go on and on and on and have a couple hour discussion of examples of how it's unfair. And primarily, uh, people are concerned about wrongful executions. Now the, uh, the other ones, ones that are innocent? Innocent and have been executed. Oh, okay. We don't know how many, but the, the uh, Troy Davis case in, in, uh, in uh, Georgia a few months ago, the Cameron Todd Willingham case, uh, the DeLuna case in Texas, all of those are very well documented where evidence has come up that there was prosecutorial misconduct or the forensic information was all wrong, that they were using junk science. These people were executed, but we're pretty sure. And I don't know how many more. There's lots of cases that they could be. But that's a core value that it's unfair to do that to people, to execute them. Another thing is, is racial, racial attitudes. Nobody's going to say, oh, I'm, I'm a racist. People don't think they are or don't do it overtly, but there's some sentiment that evidences itself and manifests itself in the administration of the death penalty because of racial attitudes. And Gallup knows this, and when we get into these discussions with people, we have to look at that. The study of uh, this, one of the pieces was this Alvarez and Brenham uh, study that said that racial resentment and symbolic racism is a predisposition to favor the death penalty. So people who... What's, what's symbolic racism? They, they just have something in their mind that they, they don't trust or they, they can't articulate it, but they have some feelings about it. Somebody's doing a seminar on that, in fact. Right now, yeah, right now. on that very subject, on that very subject, yeah. oh, on the race, on the racism study. So, in the United States, there's uh, there's uh, 3,300 people on death row, approximately 3,300 people on death row. There's been about 1,300 executions since 1976 when the death penalty came back. There's also been 140 exonerations, people who were convicted, served time, and then later proven to be innocent. Okay, if you do the math on those figures, it means like for every execution there was, or for every nine executions, there was one exoneration. Now, if you had a surgeon who only did successful surgery, one out of ten, or nine out of ten times, would you go to that surgeon? Would you get in on, on an airplane if United and Delta and Southwest had that kind of record? No, none of us would do that, but we have a justice system that's doing that. Mistakes after mistakes after mistakes. 61% of the Oregon convictions have been overturned. So here we have this dichotomy of people who have core values, and if they have core values that line up that they have some racial resentment and retribution, we're pretty sure they're going to support a death penalty. On the other side of the spectrum, if they're concerned about fairness and have a sanctity of life, we have to pretty much get them on air. Uh, they're going to be on our side. So again, I keep, this is my mantra, get people into discussions, get them to think about their core values in relationship to the death penalty. Is that uh, racial resentment applied in both directions or is it just white on black racism? So in other words, do black, uh, black people who uh, have retribution values, do they support the, uh, the death penalty? Uh, most, most people who, who are involved in this respond to the fact that when a black person kills a white person, or any person of color, doesn't necessarily have to be black, kills a white person, the statistics show that the, the, cent the chance of them getting a death penalty is six, eight, ten times as high if the, if the roles were reversed, or if a black person kills another black person. So it's manifest in that way. I do not have an answer as to how African Americans feel about that. But I think anybody who has a, a core value of fairness understands that that's not fair. The other thing, that, that's called 
pr proportionality, and the same thing happens geographically if you have one DA that says we're going to prosecute and go for the death penalty and another DA in the county next to it, the same crime, says we're not going to pursue it. How's that fair? How's that fair? You got people on death row uh, in, uh, in Washington that uh, committed a, a crime and they, they need to be punished and incarcerated, but the Green River killer who killed, what, 24 people? Under 50 years. Pardon? 50. It was 48 charged, probably a yeah, he got, he got a life sentence. He didn't get the... So where's the fairness in, in all of that? If we didn't have a death penalty, we could get rid of all that unfairness. Yes? Well, just simple support for the uh, death penalty. What percentage of the populations, ethnic populations, support the death penalty? I, I don't have a, a definitive answer for that. I can tell you about the population in death row. You get 54% of that 3,300 people are people of color, while the population is maybe 20% for all, all people of color. And so we're trying to get people to, to promote this. Have a book club, a rotary club, uh, your circle of friends, however you want to do it in your church, in your library. Promote those discussions so we can have these conversations. And it's pretty amazing when you see people turn over and say, I didn't realize that. I need to rethink this because they basically happen. Okay, I'm going to ask Frank to come up and, and tell his story. And then Bryn will have a chance to do, uh, tell a little bit more about Washington. Uh, Bruce, was it you asking the question about the percentage of blacks? Well, somebody was. Um, there has been a lot written about that, and I don't know that there are any studies that are really accurate enough to rely on in terms of what percentage of blacks are for or against it. I do know, I can say this, depending upon how that topic is raised, you will find the black community is conflicted about pro or con death penalty as any other community. If you introduce the whole notion of racism, you'll find that the black community then becomes overwhelmingly against the death penalty. And oftentimes people discuss capital punishment without being fully aware of how overwhelmingly influenced the racial issue is involved in that whole phenomenon. But otherwise, blacks are very much like most of America in terms of being for or against, unless there is a strong notion of the racist element of it. And that's from my personal experience. I don't hold myself out to speak for all blacks, but that's been my experience, certainly. I come to you as a, an administrator, a public administrator, who's had the experience of having to administer through two executions. And this was in the state of Oregon after have 34 years of there not being one. I fundamentally believe that government should not be involved in the administration of public policy unless it works, bottom line. And I don't care whether you're for the death penalty or against it, the average citizen ought to support public policies that work. The data that's out there, even among those who are proponents of the death penalty, when taken under scrutiny by national policymakers who review the statistical methods that these conclusions have been drawn, say all of the studies supporting death penalty are flawed. The, the, uh, the variables are not controlled in order to come up with the kind of data that would support the death penalty. All of the arguments are roundly flawed, making capital punishment as a public policy a fundamentally flawed position. Now, we've been in capital punishment now so many years, it's about time that we quit funding a questionable public policy. If that was a public policy that was sucking the drain, draining your public funds of uh, educating your kids, paving your streets, uh, just doing anything else that constantly failed to measure up to evidence-based outcomes, would you continue pouring your tax dollars in support of it? I don't care what side of the fence it is. That is a no-brainer. You should abandon a public policy that is not making sense, cannot sh be shown to work. Now, I've not always been against the death penalty. I was old enough to remember when Emmett Till in Mississippi was lynched and killed because he whistled at a white woman. And I can remember my mother and father being among a number of black people who felt that the people that shot that boy, that kid, ought to be lynched. And there was a righteous indignation among the black community. I'm old enough to remember when Viola, Luizo, a universal 
a uh, Unitarian Universalist, was driving civil rights workers from their demonstrations to their homes. She was shot and killed. How many of you can remember that? I can remember as a young man thinking that the only just thing that could happen to those SOBs is for them to be summarily executed. So the notion that execution would be a just sanction for those who committed heinous crime is not really foreign to Frank Thompson. I can remember being in the military wearing my uniform, carrying a pistol and a gun. And Martin Luther King was killed. I can remember thinking the person that shot Martin Luther King, the only righteous and fair thing to happen to that person is for that person to be executed. So Frank Thompson hasn't always been against execution, but I'll tell you what. When I was in Oregon and I was pulling the old execution policies and procedures off the shelves, and I was dusting the policies and procedures that promoted execution by gas, and I had to pull up brand new policies and procedures to administer an execution by lethal injection. And I was asking men and women who have children, upstanding men and women, training them how to take the life of a human being, all of a sudden I had this, this I was overwhelmed of the immorality involved in training men and women to take a life of a human being in the name of a policy that does not work. Again, I say, I don't care what side of the fence you're on. If it's not working, can't we step back and think about what else can we do? Now, I wouldn't be a part of OADP if I did not think that there were reasonable alternatives. Many times we have to continue walking down an uncomfortable road because there are absolutely no alternatives while we are doing our best to find a better way. We aren't there. There are reasonable alternatives, and that is life without parole, without the possibility of parole. I heard a question a moment ago, and I think Ron answered it. And I, the reason life without the possibility of parole, it is overwhelmingly possible in the consciousness of this society that people who commit certain kinds of crime should never be free again. And I'm one who thinks that you can abandon your rights as a, human, as a citizen in these United States of America to the extent that you should not be among the common population anymore. You can make a choice, but I don't think that person ought to be killed. I don't think that person ought to be killed in the name of a system that is so flawed. Now, I've had people say to me, Frank, have you read the study that's, that shows that our criminal justice system is 99? I'm not really sure what the percentage is. There is a study that suggests that it is the best system in the world. And I agree that our criminal justice system probably is the best system in the world. But it's flawed. Since it is as good as it is, the casualties that you liberals talk about, isn't that just the cost of doing business? And I would say, hell no. It's not like the airline industry. The airline industry accrues to our society such an overwhelming benefit that we as a country have decided, let's continue the airline industry because the benefits so significantly outweigh the downsides that it is the cost of business and these risks are worth taking. Can we say the same thing about capital punishment? Capital punishment does not accrue to society benefits so overwhelmingly determined that we can say that the taking of one innocent life is a reasonable cost of doing, of doing business. Is there anybody's, in anybody's mind in here that there is not a good likelihood that an innocent person's life might be taken in the way we conduct capital punishment. We know that particularly since the advent of DNA that people are regularly now within recent years being taken off of death row because of the flawed criminal justice system. So my answer would be, as long as you have reasonable alternatives that can affect the same outcome in terms of holding people accountable, 
why move forward in such a costly, costly process, public policy, where a, public, where a person's life can be taken <coughs> and you have reasonable alternatives. There are so many war stories that I can tell you about going into a cell and sitting down with another human being and looking at them eye to eye and watching that body language of resignation where they just hand, they hand their whole constitution over to you. I don't deserve to have that kind of power. But another human being just turns their whole constitution over to me personally. And I'm acting in the name of the citizens of the state of Oregon who unfortunately <coughs> really aren't aware that if you would take those $20 million per year and put them in our law enforcement communities, put them in alcohol and drug treatment programs, put them in mental health programs, and, believe it or not, continue to improve our forensic and investiga investigatory capabilities and here's where deterrence comes in. And if you have a good fabric of deterrence, you reduce the number of people who are on death row and you can protect society later on. A lot of people accuse me because of my position of being insensitive, I'm digressing just a moment, but I think it's important, of being insensitive to the needs of victims. The best way to protect victims is to be sure that there are fewer victims as time goes on. And one way of doing that is investing on the front end to reduce the criminal behavior, the criminal intent. How do you do that? A lot of people don't understand that the best way to pre prevent crime is to increase in the mind of the potential criminal that they will be detected, caught, seen, and apprehended. If a person on the front end has an overwhelming sense that they're likely to be seen doing whatever, that crime is not likely to occur. Now many of us are not aware of the fact that over the past few years, crime in every category is on the decline. And it's not because of capital punishment. Shoplifting in most of our department stores is on the decline. Public behaviors that offend most neighborhoods are on the decline. Why? There are cameras everywhere. Road rage on the highways are on the decline. Why? Everybody's got a cell phone where they can, uh, actions can be recorded. So without intentions, we are weaving in our society the capability to detect criminal behavior on the front end where people don't follow through. Now there's another area where crimes are really increasing rapidly, and that's cybercrime. Cybercrime is really, it's, that's increasing. But what I'm trying to say is, our notion about capital punishment deterring is ill-placed. If we really want to deter crime, put more police officers, deal with the, the warped mind that are affected with drugs and alcohol, <laughs> stop sending mental, mentally health people, uh, 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 people who have mental problems to our penitentiaries. Our penitentiaries now have become our mental institutions, unfortunately. They're sending them to prison when they really need to have better mental health care. And if we would invest 20, can you imagine, 20 million dollars a year to those kinds of programs and increase our ability to detect, apprehend, and hold accountable the criminal mind, we'll reduce the number of people that ultimately wind up on death row. Now how flawed is my logic? Hit me with it, because I'm going to have to say this in another group and I don't want, you're helping me hone my skills. I, I yes. Think, I think you're right on. I'll follow up on the thing you mentioned about the DNA. People who watch these TV programs about, oh, here's DNA solving another crime, have exaggerated the, the extent to which DNA is actually being used to solve crimes such as murder. And uh, uh, the, 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 the quiz you can take up at the meeting house has a thing in there about asking about how many of the 140 exonerated persons from death row were exonerated primarily because of DNA evidence. And I'll give away the answer. Only 17. Okay. Most of the people who get exonerated from death row because they were flat out innocent were, were found to be flat out innocent, not by the official system where the prosecutor or the judge or somebody says, oh golly, we made a mistake, let's fix it. It was their relatives, yes. journalism students, and everybody else. Yes. And we have many cases where state 
government are refusing to test DNA even when somebody is awaiting execution and maintaining his innocence after years and years and years, the states do not want to find the truth. The states do not want to find the justice. The prosecutors and the state systems just want to win. And, and we need to have a justice system that actually seeks the truth and seeks justice and does not just play games where prosecutors can win by suppressing evidence and where state governments, and there are several of them, are trying to execute people without even testing the DNA evidence that does exist. Thank you. But very DNA much. Is, is really a minor factor. Only 17 cases out of 140 did was was DNA a major factor in proving their innocence. Thank you very much. Many of you are going to hear some fairly poignant and many people think are credible studies that support the death penalty. The National Center, the National Research Center, has studied every one of those studies. And they have roundly indicted all of those supporting documents as being significantly flawed in terms of how they were conducted and remember that old saying, if you want to, you can prove anything with statistics. So uh, many times we who are against the death penalty will hit, well, during the years that the uh, United States Supreme Court did away with the death penalty, there was a rise in murder, there was a rise in capital murders. There was some ticking up in some communities for different reasons, but the statistics that were used by the pro-death penalty proponents are poorly pulled together and, and, and are not credible. Now, the research center did say this. The data that is available cannot prove that capital punishment deters, nor can it prove that it does not deter. With that being said, why would we as a country want to go headlong into continuing promoting a public policy that is still as significantly debatable. You don't spend $20 million a year on a debatable public policy where, and if you've got a reasonable alternative. So it's my position that capital punishment should be sentenced to death without the possibility of revival. <laughs> hey.